Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. Today is Tuesday, December 8th, 2015. And joining me as always on Tuesdays, the prince of Twitter, the bard of Investors Business Daily, Andrew Malcolm. <laughs> Hello. Hello. And of course, the bard. Oh, I like that. The bard of Investors Business Daily. I, I think I've come up with a with a good title for you over there at IBD. Uh oh. Uh, investors.com slash Andrew Malcolm, if you haven't been there before. And if you haven't, don't admit it because you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's, uh, we're all about shameless self promotion here at the Ed Morrissey Show. And when uh, Andrew's too Andrew's too shy, so I just do it for him. Just yeah, step that's right. right. That's me. That. Shy me. Shy you. Well, speaking of shy, um, Barack Obama held his first Oval Office speech in five years. Five years. Uh, what's interesting is that they 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 are that's about the same time that he was talking about pulling out of Iraq, and now he's having to pull himself out of pulling out of Iraq. And he held he had an Oval Office speech, which I think really by and large most people thought didn't do him much good, and in fact may have done some damage. Uh, I know Democrats the Hill has a, a a piece today about how Democrats are now having anxiety attacks about. Uh, how Obama's uh, approach on ISIS is going to damage them in 2016. Mm. I, I mean, the first thing you notice on this, and, and I, I'll say this, Andrew, with a, with an admission, with a with a caveat, if you will. Um, I didn't actually watch it live. I I read the transcript because I had no desire to watch this thing live, and yeah. um, and I had better things to do. And the first thing I noticed, because there was you know pictures being tweeted out about it, and I I saw a little video roll on it. While it was going on, why was why did they have a podium in front of the of the? You desk? know, yeah, that's a very intriguing question. He, for some reason, uh, hates uh, Oval Office speeches. This is, as you pointed out, only the third. He, the first one was on the oil spill in the Gulf, uh, but it was weeks late. Weeks late. Um, the second one was on uh, whoopee doo, the victory lap, where we pulled all the troops out of Iraq. And then there's this one. <clears throat> and of course, the pullout is what forced him to have this one. Um, but he's, he, he doesn't like it. It's, um, I guess it's uncomfortable for him. He likes standing, he likes being tall. Uh, and um, so they set up a podium in front of the desk, which is Rather curious, but um, then again, this is the guy who back in 08 set up a podium in a rodeo arena. <laughs> in, seriously, no, in, you're right. si in six inches of dirt and other material. Uh, and he stood there with a teleprompter and a podium. Um, this, is a, this is a podium kind of guy. Uh, and, uh, so you're right. I don't think it did him, uh, I don't think it did him any good. Uh, but then as, gee, as luck would have it, it's probably just a coincidence. Donald Trump, um, does his, um, ban all Syrian or Muslim immigrants, uh, the next day to completely change the subject and get it off, uh, Clinton and Obama's, um, uh, ISIS, um, uh, mistakes well, so yeah we're going to come back to that but i don't want to get off of the speech quite yet because i do want to talk about the i do want to talk about uh, trump's uh trump's blathering on this in a moment <laughs> but the problem i think there, there was a couple of problems with obama's speech in fact i think that there were probably three basic problems one was that the optic optics of it were a problem and not just because of the a podium but because when you have an Oval Office speech, which is very rare in the Obama presidency, it was a little bit more common than, you know, like Bill Clinton or Ronald Reagan or or even George Bush. Very rare with Obama to be in the Oval Office. You expect that to mean something. There is going to be some yeah, yeah. some serious policy laid out, some change. You know, maybe a call to arms. Okay, we're at war. It's time we recognized it. Something like that. As I speak, American planes. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. That type, That's the type of thing that you expect from an Oval Office speech, especially for a president who clearly does not like the, the, uh, the trappings of an Oval Office speech. But instead, what we got was 
four paragraphs on ISIS, which basically said that he's going to continue doing exactly what he's been doing before, which hasn't been working, and people have lost confidence in that strategy. The second thing was that um, we need to ban more guns, and we need to use the no-fly list, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on with Scott Shackford from Reason. And third, don't be mean to Muslims. Uh, <laughs> It, yeah, that and was that was, part. I counted the words, that was 26% of his uh, 1,900 words. I'm glad you counted the words, because I was just counting paragraphs, so I was coming up with, you know, rough estimates, but a third of it roughly was, uh, I think about a third of it roughly was, um, I'm going to do exactly what I've been doing before, and then a quarter of it was, don't be mean to Muslims, <laughs> yeah. and then what was left was for banning guns. And, and banning people on the no-fly list, which is a complete non sequitur because none of the terrorist attacks which Obama cited, including two that he had to admit were terrorist attacks before, none of those people were on the no-fly list. None of them were. None of these people were on the no-fly list, and Syed Farouk and Tashfeen Malik weren't even on the FBI's radar screen. They didn't even yeah. know about these people. I mean... So I, I think that when you're looking at this, people are scratching their heads and going, what was this speech about? I mean, why bother with this speech? This is basically yeah. the same thing he's been saying all along. Well, it's about the narrative, you know, with him. I, I don't think he wanted to give this speech. Um, I I think his staff made him give this speech because he had to, they felt he it was time for him to say something. He didn't want to say anything new, so he didn't. He said something. Um, and But here's the thing. <clears throat> he often gives these kinds of remarks. Uh, in this one, in effect, he said, we're going, to, we're going to, um, to stress this. We're going to do that. Last week, uh, right after the shootings, he said, um, we're going to emphasize. We're going to double down. It... Nothing means anything. Words are, they're, they're like a stage scrim. Uh, they're things that he throws up in defense. This was a very defensive speech. Uh, we are doing something. I mean, this phony 65-member coalition that Canada just dropped out of, um, allegedly fighting ISIS, uh, he talks about thousands of, of, of planes attacking over time, but guess what? 80% of them come back with, uh, with their ordinance still on because of his clumsy, awkward, crippling rules of engagement. Uh, so he wants to look like he's doing something, and the way he feels he does something is talk, but he's not really doing anything. My, I did a column for Monday morning at Investors.com, and the headline said, um, um, uh, terrorism isn't scaring Americans, Obama is. And, and he is. He's scaring Americans by his disconnection, by his delusion. He sees things as he wants to see them. Uh, oh, ISIS is contained. Well, no, they're not. Paris, a uh, uh, hundred and thirty deaths. That was a setback, really. Right. Um, uh, we don't know. Remember last week? We don't know whether this is terrorism. Okay, look. Uh, was there a sentient American who didn't know that was terrorism when it happened? When the police radio had the guy's name that they were looking for? You know, come on. Let's, well, the fact that there were two people involved. Actually, initially they said three, but two people were involved, and there were pipe bombs left behind at the scene. I mean, right. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is obviously not just your average, I got angry at work and decided to lash out at my, uh, at my and colleagues. 1,400 rounds in the car, Yeah, yeah. which was rented. Uh, and it took them allegedly eight hours to tell, or eight or ten hours to tell us who they were. Okay, look, they had two bodies after the shootout, they had a car that was, or a, an SUV that was rented with California plates, rented to somebody, one of the dead people. They had an address in Redlands and no name. As one guy on Twitter tweeted, is Rahm Emanuel in charge of this operation? <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's, it's Inspector Cluzo. Uh, and uh, you can go out as, I understand, police 
I understand police being careful. I can't understand political leaders who want the support of people going out and saying, look, I can't understand them not doing this. Look, we don't know for sure. I understand what all your fears and suspicions are. And by golly, we're going to tell you everything we know as soon as we know it. Uh, because this is serious stuff. But no, he said, don't jump to conclude. Now, you know, the guy spent his formative childhood years living in the capital of the world's most populous Muslim country, which has very roughly handled its Muslim extremists, by the way. Right. Um, so it's not surprising that he would feel a certain stronger sensibility about Muslims. But he was twice elected uh, by people to be commander-in-chief with his top responsibility of protecting Americans. And Americans are clearly scared boopless right now and he needs to address that and because he doesn't people start suspecting him and suspecting his motives when he comes up for so many uh, excuses one of the things one of the main purposes of this speech he said the threat from terrorism is real now, this is sherlock holmes <laughs> Captain Obvious. Yeah, imagine Franklin Roosevelt informing the nation that Japan's Pearl Harbor bombing 74 years ago yesterday morning was an attack. Yeah, you yeah. think? And, and and waiting four days to do so. And, you know, and then, I mean, and the then, guy is just not on the same planet. And then saying and, that the, that the solution to this is to ban guns. And mm -hmm. don't be mean to Japanese Americans, by the way. That's right. Which, by the way, yeah. FDR was, but that's a whole other topic. But yeah. Another Democrat. When you think about it, Jim Crow, the Japanese camps. Uh, we did have uh, German camps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, um, a cluster boop, and, and it's, it's scaring the bejesus out of people. I, I love the fact that you're that you are 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 self bleeping your uh your yeah your, yeah. Well, your, I don't your, want to create more work for you. Well, you know that that, that that actually qualifies you to be on Fox News. You, you know that they uh, that they <laughs> yeah they, they suspended uh, Ralph Peters and Stacey Dash for uh, for for not being terribly disciplined about the way they spoke on air. <laughs> well, look, just think, let's let's just go through a, a small list. Okay, uh, the Benghazi attacks, they were because of a video. Um, ISIS is the JV. ISIS is contained. The Paris attacks were setbacks. The ISIS fight is going well. Al-Qaeda is on the run. Uh, Pentagon investigators are now investigating, um, uh, you know, cooking the, the, the intelligence books. There's not a scintilla of uh, corruption in the IRS screwing over conservative opponents of the president. Uh, ISIS does bad things, but don't forget the Crusaders did too in 1096. ISIS burns a Jordanian pilot alive and Obama stages a summit on, extre on extremism that's so important he gives not one, but two speeches. And, of course, nothing happens. The uh, Ramadi Falls the, that we spent so much treasure on uh, and, and flood Felicia, on, yeah. on capturing, it falls to ISIS. Obama goes golfing. And that same day, he unveiled his new Twitter page with, Hello, Twitter, it's Barack, really. This is when Ramadi falls. Right. Okay? Um, Obama says global warming is the worst threat to national security, and his generals say Russia, China, North Korea, ISIS, in that order. Um, uh, he says that uh, we can thoroughly vet uh, thousands of uh, Syrian refugees that he wants to take in, and the FBI says, no, no, we can't. Uh, and it, it, the list is endless for how this guy shows that he's dragging his feet, reluctant to admit uh, the war on terror. Now, if you're in politics and you're as good as he's supposed to be, uh, when you uh, find yourself in a hole, you know, you get all the bad stuff out, 
and uh, you say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Now, okay, uh, Harvard graduates cannot apologize, but they're not supposed to be stupid. Right, yeah. And he's acting stupid. Well, he's acting as though he's detached from reality. I'm, yeah, I'm really, he is. Clearly, what planet? Nate Beeler had this great um, editorial cartoon a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I I know that you know Michael Ramirez is the king of all uh, editorial cartoonists, and we all hail Michael Ramirez. And by the way, I should pro probably point out that, hang on, speaking of promotion, you can get your copy of Give Me Liberty or Give Me Obamacare, Michael Ramirez's <laughs> new book, um, which, by the way, is awesome. I mean, I've been following Michael Ramirez, so I've seen a lot of these. Some of these I missed, but um, but yeah, you can get that. But Nate Beeler, <laughs> another excellent editorial cartoonist. You see how I, I, I slide those plugs in there? Yes, I'm that's kind of very hoping... slide. Yeah, I, I, wonder, I wonder if you're going to do that when this new book comes out next well, spring. I'm hoping to build up some karma points here so that, you know, when... Um, and, and, and just make sure everybody understands it. Going Red, which is coming out from Crown Forum in April 2016, is published. I'm hoping that maybe we can have a few other people slide those mentions into, into <laughs> podcasts as well. I'm just saying, you know, it's a pay it forward sort of thing, I think. But at any rate, I mean... Um... <laughs> it looks, hey folks, it looks like many many states are going red this cycle. Gonna which, go by the way, is the title of a new book yeah yeah exactly so there you go so but at any rate nate beeler had this great editorial cartoon um in which obama is floating in a bubble and he's saying isis is contained and you see the paris you know, blood splatter from paris underneath him and and i think that's obama still to this day he is in this bubble where his strategy is working isis is contained al qaeda is on the run i actually think this guy sort of believes it because He's basically ignoring everything that's telling him that he's wrong. Well, Benghazi, you know, remember he it's his his morning statement, M O U R. Actually, I guess it was in the morning too. His morning statement that. about the Benghazi murders uh, and how there would be such swift justice, which we haven't seen yet, um, it was was so uh, so terrible. And then he managed to summon the strength to fly off to several fundraisers in Las Vegas. Um, remember when James Foley uh, was beheaded and there was such national outrage, uh, Obama, he wasn't going to, but he interrupted his vacation to do a news conference on James Foley and then went golfing with his NBA buddies um, but he did have a moment of silence on the fourth on the fourth tee. Yeah, yeah, and skipped the funeral of the first general to be killed in combat. Um, but he sent uh, three or four people to Ferguson for that funeral. Uh, you know, the guy is um, is not connected. Uh, I and not connected to our reality. And if he wants us to do something. I mean, if a leader wants people to do things, he has to show. The first words out of his mouth is, "I hear you." Yeah, you know, I I, I hear you, but that's impossible for Obama to admit. And um, I don't know if it's Valerie Jarrett and the the people around him. He's not so isolated. He's not he's not stupid. And so what people then begin to do is suspect the motives, um, and you can see a lot more stuff. About him being a plant, him be. Uh, how could anybody look at that or negotiate and then look at that Iranian deal and say that Iran can't get a nuclear weapon? Um, how could anybody look at uh, Iran testing two middle range ballistic missiles in recent weeks in violation of, of UN sanctions, plural, and not say a word about it? Uh, and instead, we're talking about uh, uh, keeping no-fly list people. Now, the no-fly list is is a joke. It's it's a catch-all garbage list that people get dumped on. They've had generals on it. They've had journalists on it. Um, remember uh, that guy who um, parked his car in Times Square? I don't know how you can do that. Yeah. By the way, I don't. Uh, there's no place to park a car there. But. Um, 
he parked his car in Times Square and the bomb didn't go off. And so he fled and he went to Connecticut and whatever. And then he went to Kennedy and he got on a flight to the, uh, on an Emirates flight to Dubai. Uh, and uh, the flight was out. And I did a post on this when I was at the LA Times. I had the audio. Uh, the Emirates plane, uh, you could, it was a recording of the tower. And the tower says, uh, Emirates 580 cleared for active. Uh, runway 280 left and he says emirates to uh, emirates 280 whatever uh roger and you you hear the engines and he starts to pull onto the active runway and then the control tower comes on very calmly and says uh emirates 280 uh, return to the gate and uh, the pilot says uh, say again and he said emirates 280 re return to the gate it's a company thing <laughs> and and he goes to the first turn off and goes back to the gate because the the, the Times Square bomber was on his plane right. and after the plane left the gate the TSA goes wait a minute <laughs> this passenger's name is on this forbidden list yeah it's a it's and a, that's how they caught the guy you know I mean it's thing. it's a it's a joke and it's it's like there's a whole bunch of Inspector Clouseaus. Uh, running around and trying to tell us that we're doing it, we're we're doing everything, we're going to do everything, we're going to, and and there is no more credibility. Right. You know, at some point, when it involves death and blood and fear, people go, ah, no, sorry, not believing this, and that's where we are. It is. I where don't we're care at. how many Oval Office speeches he gives. It is where we're at. All right. So you wanted to talk about Donald Trump's proposal that. We should ban Muslims from coming into the United States, including at least briefly, Muslim citizens, Muslim American citizens who were returning from traveling overseas. Although later they kind of backed off that one. Um, yeah. Now, I, well. I, I was actually on the air yesterday. I was on Relevant Radio guest hosting when that came up. Oh, and I, I was kind of dumbfounded. I'm thinking, you know, I, I I wasn't one of the people who immediately said. It's unconstitutional to do that because actually there's a great deal of latitude um, in terms of immigration policy and the constitutional safeguards on, you know, for instance, 14th Amendment safeguards don't really apply to it uh, because the U.S. has basically uh, full plenary authority to decide who is going to get in and who is not going to get in. And the 14th Amendment doesn't apply to it because it's not a constitutionally... Um, the Constitution doesn't necessarily apply to entry into the United States. Once you're in the United States, and it applies, obviously, but it doesn't govern how the United States brings Isn't that in. why we have Guantanamo? Because they're not in the United States. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's still kind of under debate, but at, but at least this this is not under debate. But it doesn't mean that it's a, a, it's a smart thing to do. As Ben Shapiro said, well, you can basically kiss intelligence cooperation goodbye with the very people that we have to be working with. <laughs> In order to in order to spot these threats, um, yeah, yeah, this is this is Donald Trump though. I mean, he's seeing a he's seeing the moment that you're talking about, right? Um, th this moment of weakness, this moment of unreality, really, in 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 the White House. And it's not just I'm not meaning just a literal moment. I'm talking about this period of time where Obama has just been clueless about about the about this threat that's been rising from ISIS. And he's taking advantage of it by basically demagoguing and, and feeding people's fears about it. Now, the fears are legitimate. Uh, that policy statement really isn't. And um, But I don't know that a whole lot of voters are really going to make a whole make a big distinction between the two. He's the one that's talking to their he's the one that's talking to their fears. Absolutely. I don't want to boast, but on June seventeenth, two thousand and fifteen. I wrote a column that said Donald Trump is laughable and dangerous. And I said that he was like Rachel Dolezal. She thought she was white and he thought she was a uh, he thought he was a legitimate presidential candidate. He's not. He is a stalking horse for Hillary Clinton. And if you go through what Trump has done, it feeds his ego, which probably is the primary reason, but it also helps corrode the brand of the Republican Party, yeah. and just as Ross Perot did, another self-funding billionaire candidate angry at a Republican um, incumbent, 
um, he will end up splitting the Republican vote or support and electing, oh, look, Hillary Clinton as opposed to Bill Clinton in 1992. Uh, the guy is, I mean, if you look at what he's done to propose this, um, you can argue that it feeds on the clear support against, I mean, our, our new IBD poll shows people don't want Syrian refugees uh, um, because you can't, you can't vet them. Um, and the FBI admits that. Right. Uh, so, so Trump takes this step the same way he started off by calling all Mexicans rapists um, and he claims to be a Republican. Well, he's not, he's not a Republican. I'm sorry. He's funded Democrats over the years way more than Republicans. He's a pal of Hillary's, had her in the front row at his wedding. He's given the foundation, Clinton Foundation um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and suddenly he's opposed to Hillary Clinton uh, because he's running on the Republican side. Um, and what are we doing? The, all the oxygen that Republican candidates, legitimate ones, could have been expending on discussing real issues and making their own cases is now being devoted to, well, what do you think about Donald Trump's idea? Right. And, and, and we're losing it. And uh, who would blame Americans next fall if they go, geez, I don't know, those Republicans, they were loopy over Trump. Well, 26% were, but, but not most Republicans, because he's a stalking horse. He's here to help elect Hillary Clinton. And they may not have a signed document but, uh, between them, but it suits their joint purposes perfectly. And uh, I'm sorry, nobody's going to convince me otherwise. Um, that his his goal is to help elect Hillary. And uh, he's doing a pretty darn good job of it. You know what's interesting about this? It, it, by the way, there's a poll out today that said that 68% of the support that he is getting would go with him if he decided to run as an independent. Sure. Um, which actually, I think, probably would have worked out better for him in the long run to do that, but then you couldn't do the damage that you're doing to the Republican Party uh, in yeah. an independent uh, right now. I mean... I, I actually disagree with you. I don't think that he's doing that. I think he's doing it for the same reason he wanted to do it in 2011 is I think he got a taste of it in 2011. I think 2011 was more of a lark, you know, so he could kind of boost his boost his profile so he could uh, he could wheedle another year out of NBC for The Apprentice. This time, I think he figured, you know what? I could have actually gone all the way in 2011 and 2012. I should just go, go back and do this again. Um, and... <laughs> This guy, I, I, I described him a few weeks ago as basically an unrestrained id with unlimited <laughs> resources, <laughs> and, and that's basically what he is. Now, I still don't think <laughs> Republicans will nominate him, but I'm, I mean, I, I can't say categorically that it won't happen, and let's say, for, uh, let's say that, that he does decide to go independent. You know, I know that Republicans are afraid of that, but let me, and I haven't really seen the poll in detail. I've seen the report about it on CNN and, uh, uh, excuse me, on The Hill. I saw it in The Hill. Um, you know, 68% of those people who say they support Donald Trump now would stick with him from an independent run. That's really easy to say now, though. And we have to remember that it's 68% of, I don't know, the 26, 27% that he's getting in yeah. in the primary. So you're talking about 19 to 20% of the primary respondents in polls right now, and you have to ask yourself, which what is you, what Perot got well, in the in, no, in, the in, in the general election. election. Yeah, but you know, it's it's actually a fairly limited slice of people who. Would oh yeah, defect. yeah, sure it is, but plus, it's enough to screw it up. Plus, though, you have to actually spend money if you're going to run it as an independent candidate. He spent very little money. I mean, for Donald Trump, it's it's you know peanuts. It's around. I think at the end of the quarter, he had spent $220,000 all year. <laughs> I mean, everything he's doing right now is basically on, you know, personal appearances in different places and on free media, right? Earned media uh, exposure. Yeah. When you have to run for yourself, you have to build organizations. You have to first get yourself on the ballot in 50 states. And, I mean, Donald Trump has the resources. He's got the money to do this. I don't know that he's got the discipline or the time to do it. And 
beyond that, you have, and this is where we get into some of the territory that I cover in Going Red, which will be coming out in April 2016 <laughs> from Crown Forum Books. Be sure to pre-order your book now. Um, the uh, the link is in the show post, folks. Uh, when is that publication in? It's uh, April 2016. Yeah, it's April. A, it's April. about a month That's after not CPAC. That's far away. It people isn't... should pre-order, probably. People should pre-order. Definitely go over and pre-order. Um, but at any rate. Um, it takes more than it takes more than just being on the ballot to get that type of response. You know, uh, Ross Perot did spend a lot of money. He had a lot of money and he spent it. And and he he created a reform party that he funded in large part, obviously, but also built a, a an organization that had a particular purpose, which was to find a third way between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And Perot was very committed to that. Uh, he wasn't necessarily committed to running. He was committed also to defeating his Texas enemy. He was. George, George H.W. Bush. Yeah, it was yeah. personal. It was definitely personal with Perot. But I don't think Trump's got that. And you have to have that kind of organization, and you have to put that kind of organization on the ground. I think once Trump goes independent and starts doing his own thing, I mean, his own thing is basically going to be continuing doing what he's doing right now, except for the effort to get his name on the ballot. And I actually don't think that he's going to draw more than 4 or 5% if he does that. Now, that being said, 4 or 5%, depending on where it goes and, and who, you know, yeah. it, that can really screw up uh, in some of these states that I've been in because some of those things are close-run uh, issues. But, but look, I mean, I'm not necessarily sure that it's a disaster for Republicans to uh, give Trump the boot and let him run independent. I, I, I'm not necessarily sure that yeah. that would be as big a disaster as having him go all the way down to the convention before losing the uh, before losing the nomination, which is what it's yeah. looking like it's going to happen right now. Yeah, well, it's um, it's a mess. It's interesting. Uh, the media loves to perpetuate it. Uh, Hillary loves to have it per per perpetuated. Uh, I don't. I don't think Trump is going to win Iowa, which is not fatal. I mean, it didn't elect President Huckabee. It didn't elect President Santorum. Um, we'll well, see Cruz, what happens. Cruz in, is uh, going to win Iowa. Cruz is well organized in Iowa. He's well, been he's organized well organized, and then. more importantly, he's evangelical, which is yeah. that's the crucial thing. Um, I'm not sure that's going to do it unless he keeps on doing it and I know that he's organizing all across the southeast and the south um, in kind of an impressive way you know doing weekend bus tours uh, sort of under the radar uh, and um, New Hampshire um, should be uh, should be interesting uh, he doesn't seem to me like a New Hampshire kind of guy um, uh, and I've always had it in the back of my mind that Chris Christie, like John McCain, is going to pull off a, something of a surprise in New Hampshire. Uh, and, uh, you know, the structure of the Republican primary system this time is, uh, shall we say, complicated. Yeah. But it's also designed to prolong the race because at some point in March we start having proportional victories in states right and that that'll keep some of the marginal people in if they can get three percent or four percent or whatever that'll that'll keep them going um so new hampshire <clears throat> new hampshire i think will be the uh will will be a deciding one iowa is sort of a almost predictable show um Christie is spending the time and the focus. You know, he's not really invested much in in Iowa, other than occasional appearances. On um, in New Hampshire, you go living room to living room, and you know the old saying about uh, New Hampshire voters say, "Well, you know, I don't know if I'm going to support him. I've only seen him person talk with him twice." Um, is um, is going to is going to go against? Uh, the Trump type mass rally candidates, which, um, oh, look, it's what uh, George W. Bush did in 99 and 2000. And John yeah. McCain, who was doing all the town halls and the living rooms, uh, absolutely killed him, I think, by 19 points in the end uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, so uh, we'll see. I don't think Trump's going to do that well there. Um, South Carolina. You know, that's the next one. 
and Nevada. I just, um, but you know, he doesn't have to win to screw it up for Republicans. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the prediction business, but uh, I think the image of the Republican Party has become attached to him, and I'm not sure that that negative image, negative Hispanic, negative uh, immigrants, is going to be uh, expunged uh, or can be erased uh, in time for uh, for next year. And typical egotist, if he doesn't he doesn't care as long as it's all about him. Uh, so it's it's kind of a mess. I'm in, uh, except when I'm talking with you, Ed. You give me hope. <laughs> I am I'm in despair about the country and uh, and the election at the moment. Well, you know what would give you hope? Going red, coming out in April 26th. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I, I I should tell people this. I, I just got off a marketing call with Crown Forum, and so now it's like, okay, I gotta do all these different things, you know, it, nothing right away, but I mean, I just have tasks that I gotta do. So all this stuff is sort of like in the back of my mind while I'm doing this show. And so I know Andrew's got a great sense of humor. Uh, I I promise you, I won't be doing that with other guests, but that's because Andrew and I are great friends, and he knows how to play <laughs> off this stuff. So and he was gonna, you were gonna surprise me with a question. I was going to surprise you with the question, which is, where are you going to be next uh, next Tuesday? I'm in the same place, I guess. I don't oh, know. Oh, because I'm going to be in Las Vegas for the debate. And I think, uh, oh, look I think, at that. I think we can still do a show. We'll have uh, Cranky T-Rex set it up. Because, I, I mean, I, I, the, the thing starts, I think, at 7 o'clock. Or, well, it'll be... You know, seven o'clock Eastern time. I think it starts out there, and we're you know like th- you know, four o'clock Eastern time. And I think what we'll do is we'll just do a show with you and I to do a debate. That, that early? Okay. Well, you just tell me. Well, four Eastern I'll time. We'll do four Eastern time, which is our normal our normal time, and we'll just have uh, uh, Cranky T Rex uh, produce it for us next week. Which means okay. So you're going to be at the debate, boy. That'll yeah. be. Uh, you can give us some real color. That'll be wonderful. Yeah, I can give you lots of color. Lots of color. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll let that one. Uh, I'll let that one slide. You know, I, I guess I could tell you about you know what Donald Trump's uh, buffet favorites are. Maybe that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll follow Donald Trump around and report back what he's eating. Uh, all right, so um, we're almost out of time. We do need the jokes of the week, though, Andrew. Sure. Well, Jimmy Fallon says uh, that uh, a man dressed as Santa Claus is uh, outside Macy's every day, and he's charging kids $5 for a photo. And asked why he's doing it, Trump said these children are terrible negotiators. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and uh, Conan O'Brien said that, you know, Trump came under some fire for mocking a reporter with disabilities. Um during a news conference a while back and yeah. uh trump said don't worry i'll soon do something far worse and this will be all forgotten and he was right <laughs> and he was right and he was right yeah uh and finally uh conan said that uh kim kardashian you know she had uh, another kid over the weekend uh but she waited until monday to reveal her new baby's name and reporters asked her why the delay and she said well, we're very private people. <laughs> what was the baby's name, anyway? Yeah. What was uh, the baby's name? I, I I didn't even realize that uh, that there was a baby. The baby's here. name. Uh, well, remember the first one was North. Yeah. And this one is Saint. <laughs> yeah. Nothing like having to live up to a name, right? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, one other one, we'll slip it in here. Uh, Jimmy Fallon said that Kobe O'Brien um, has announced that uh, uh, he's um, he's quitting professional basketball. Yeah. Which which means he's signing with the Philadelphia 76ers. Ah, there you go. All things are explained. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andrew. Well, we will talk to you next week as a debate preview. We'll do a, a Tim show while I'm on the road, and we'll talk. Okay. Uh, we'll talk then, but. Until then, tell everyone at Investors Business Daily that we say hi, investors.com slash Andrew Andrew Malcolm. And uh, don't forget to follow Andrew on Twitter. If you're not already following Andrew, hang your head in shame. He is the (laughs) prince of Twitter. Andrew Malcolm, (laughs) thanks for being with me today, sir. You bet, Ed. Travel safe. Thank you, sir. Talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. Yeah, I got the... Not only did I dial it wrong, I actually got the number wrong.
Reason, this is Scott speaking. Hi, Scott. This is Ed Morrissey from Hot Air. How are you doing? Okay, how are you doing? I, I'm doing great. Thank you very much for being on today. Uh, great uh, article that you had in Reason on the no-fly list. I think you and I are probably in uh, agreement on the latest proposal from Democrats as to how to secure the country, which is to bar sales to people whose names appear on the no-fly list. Barack Obama says that this is a... Uh, it's it's national security after all. It's a national security issue after all, and that there's no reason to allow suspected terrorists to buy um, semi-automatic weapons. Um, right. Yeah, it sounds great. How can you guys at Reason possibly oppose this uh, policy, Scott? I just don't understand. You guys are not being reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's. Where should I begin? Um, to start with the the. No fly list, um, and I'm going to expand out further than that because it turns out it's probably actually much bigger than that. Um, there is no due process to the no fly list. Uh, so, for example, it's all in control of the, the executive branch of the government. It's all in control of Homeland Security and and the Department of Justice. If they suspect someone is maybe involved with terrorism, um, they can put them on the list. But they don't have to tell us about it. They don't even have to tell the people, you know, who are on the list about it. You only find out about it when you try to fly. Furthermore, um, there is no real formal process where you can get information about your inclusion on the list and really, really fight back or appeal. Well, there is an appeal process, but it is you're appealing to the people who put you on the list. Uh, it's, it's not like, for example, when we talk about our surveillance practices and we had the discussion, the big debate over surveillance of American citizens, even though it was all very secretive, um, there was a secret court that oversaw the process. So the NSA had to go to this court to get permission to do things. Uh, whether or not that actually worked is another debate, but it, the court was there. Um, that isn't even the case with this. There's no court. There's no one for you to turn to other than the beg to be off the list. And it used to be they wouldn't even confirm that you were on the list in the first place. You're essentially just sending them information about yourself and hoping to prove that you are not a terrorist so you can fly. Uh, the American Civil Liberties Union uh, took objection to the lack of due process, and uh, they're representing a group of people, uh, and there have been some other additional lawsuits. Uh, they've sued... Uh, to, to essentially create due process. They're not even suing to get off the list. They're suing for the right to to fight their way off the list, essentially. And so far, they're winning. Um, a judge ruled recently that the uh, last year, actually, that the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security uh, had to create a better system of due process so that people can fight to get off the list. Well, I mean... This is the type of thing that actually had liberals up in arms when it was uh, when it was first expanded. Now the no flight list actually did exist before 9/11. Had I think, if I remember correctly, about 15 people on it, maybe a little less than that. Um, and uh, but but after that, obviously there there was a lot of um, use put into that. Uh, they they expanded it greatly. They added tons of names. We have a no-fly list. And we also have the 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 broader terrorist uh, suspected terrorist list, uh, which is much larger. I think we're talking about 1.1 million names, uh, but most of those yeah. are most of those live abroad. That's what. Well, you know, it's it, <laughs> it's tough to say. I mean, it depends on who you're willing to believe, because of course we don't have access to the list. It's all very secretive, and. You know, it's only as a result of, of lawsuits and fighting against this that we even have a sense as to how many people are on it. Um, we know uh, what was leaked last year um, was around 700,000. Um, it's had as many as 1.5 million names. So it changes. People get put on there. People are taken off uh, through this process. So it's not like the process doesn't happen, that the government doesn't take people off the list. It's just that it's not a very open process. We, have, we really have no way of forcing the matter. It's all to it's all due to government discretion. And uh, so, yeah, a number, a number that, that um, PolitiFact was told was 10,000 Americans. But we have no way of knowing whether or not that's actually true. I've heard 20,000 as well. But at any rate, there's a number of people on there. They, they, there is no due process. There's no transparency as to how these people end up on it. They aren't notified when they, when they end up on it until they go to try to travel, and they are denied 
uh, access to airplanes. Now, it's one thing to say, I mean, you can argue, I know Reason probably wouldn't um, accept this argument, but it, it's, you can at least argue that you don't have a constitutional right to board an airplane um, and that there might be more leeway in that, but there is a constitutional right to bear arms in the United States. It's a constitutional right. It's, it's actually an explicitly enumerated right. And the only way that the government should be able to prevent you from exercising a explicitly enumerated right in the Constitution would be to have some sort of due process in which you, uh, which there is an adjudication uh, that shows that you are either a felon who can't be, you know, trusted to do that, or some other, you know, some other status that would, you know, for instance, mental instability, that sort of thing, uh, that precludes you from being able to do that. Barring that. There should be no um, there should be no impediments to an American citizen or an American legal resident from being able to uh, buy firearms. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And there is you know because it's this and they're still being sued by the American Civil Liberties Union because the due process that they've started to put into place is still very insufficient. Um, and you know and for that reason. Under and earlier today, I actually read through the the failed an amendment that uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein introduced, and it really just gives the Attorney General just permission to deny um, on the basis of any sort of belief that you know any sort of suspicion. It's based on suspicion, not on due process, uh, that someone is connected to terrorism, not just international terrorism. But domestic terrorism, right? Uh, and the it does create a possibility to fight uh, the denial with the attorney general's office. It's, so if the attorney general says no, we think you're we think you're connected to terrorists. We're not going to let you buy a gun. You you are able to fight it, but um, because this involves national security, the attorney general has permission to withhold information. Um, as to why they're they're denying you, so so you won't have enough information. To, you might not have enough information to fight back. And furthermore, furthermore, the threshold that the attorney general would have to provide in order to justify it is would be the uh, evidence preponderance of the evidence instead of it's it's a looser evidence threshold than actually having to convict someone of a crime. Right. Yes. And even if you're acquitted of a crime, doesn't necess- as the Intercept found out. I think it was earlier this year. It may have been last year. Uh, even if you're con- even if you're acquitted of a crime, <laughs> or you know of a charge, I should say, of uh, you know related to terrorism, they don't have to take your name off the no-fly list. And and look, I mean, I get I get why that might be, but you can't deny people their rights based on suspicion, uh, especially secret government list suspicion. And the other part of this that's really frustrating to me which is like so many other examples of gun control uh, proposals, is that it wouldn't have anything to do with the cases that are at hand. In fact, uh, Tashfeen Malik and Syed Farouk were not on the no-fly list. They flew into the United States in uh, July 2014 uh, and were uh, were admitted. uh, We've got a picture of them coming through uh, the um, uh, immigration, uh, the, the passport control. Uh, the people who did uh, the the uh, Fort Hood shooting, the, the Chattanooga shooting, um, those people weren't on the no-fly list. Uh, right. The, the Boston Marathon bar- bomber, one of them, Tamerlan Tsarnaev, uh, the FBI received warnings from the Russians in 2011 that he was being radicalized and that he had contacts in uh, Dagestan, I believe it was, uh, with radical Islamists, and they still let him fly out and back into the country in 2012. He never got on the on the no-fly list. Uh, so this is just a huge red herring, is it not, Scott? Yeah, I would say, you know, if, if you look at the politics behind this, well, first of all, they have to know, the Democrats have to know that it's not going to pass in the first place because the Republican controls both houses. And they're not going to restrict guns under these circumstances. So it's very it's a very political look. You know the Republicans are so and you know they're invoking the NRA. They're so they're saying they're so in the pocket of the National Rifle Association that they won't even restrict gun rights for terrorists. You know, ignoring in, in just kind of blatantly ignoring the history of opposition 
to the, the watch list, which comes from the left. And so it's just, I don't even think they really noticed that or thought about that. It's just, it's an attempt to, to use gun control as a typical political wedge issue. Right. And I don't think they thought about it beyond that. No, I don't think they've thought about it beyond that either, although I was very disappointed, and I'm not necessarily a fan of the organization anyway, but I was very disappointed in the ACLU's reaction was, well, you know, if they fix it a little bit, maybe it would work, meaning the list. Yeah, and that's, that's really unfortunate because even if they fixed it to what the LC would like, where it was the due process to get off, it's still denying somebody of a defined civil liberty without actually proving their involvement with a crime. You know, right. So there still wouldn't be, there would be due process for getting off the list, but there still wouldn't have been due process to having your gun rights restricted. No. And that's the problem. And that's the problem. But you, know, you can... You can hold your breath waiting for the ACLU to defend the Second Amendment, and and you'll you won't last long. And <laughs> believe me, <laughs> they, they 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 like some of the Constitution. They don't necessarily like all of it. That's the reason why I always bristle a little bit. Of, well, how, how how can you oppose the ACLU? They stand up for the civil rights of Americans. No, they stand up for the ones that they like. They don't stand up for all of the civil rights of Americans. And this is a really good example of that. They're they're fine having. Uh, this type of thing go on as long as it meets some sort of oddball standard that they're going to set up for themselves. And look, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I'm not an absolutist on this. I, I, I understand that there, there, there is room for background checks on gun sales. I understand that a no-fly list in the age of terrorism is one of those things that you kind of have to put up with in order to make sure that at least somebody's checking these flight. Uh, you know, these flight manifests to see if there, there might be a problem. I get that. Uh, but this has, one has nothing to do with the other. And it hasn't had anything to do with the other the entire time that we've had the no-fly list. There is absolutely no uh, information that the, the, the people who are on the no-fly list who have bought firearms, and that's about 2,000 of them who have, have been any sort of threat whatsoever. There have been 2,000 right. purchases off of this no-fly list from 2001 to 2014, none of which has been used, not even in a crime, let alone <laughs> a terrorist attack. And yet here we are discussing this as if it's some sort of, you know, we've got to, we've got to sacrifice for the good of America and, and, and give up this constitutional right if the government decides that you look funny. Right, yeah. Jamel Bowie. I mean, you know, I'm not necessarily a guy who agrees with Jamel Bowie a whole lot over at Slate. I don't know if you read his piece. But he said, you know, basically from the left saying, this is a really bad idea. Uh, one yeah, of, there was a, yeah, there was one of the Daily Beast today as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Some people are awake are realizing, you know, and, and it kind of really bothered me at the outset where I saw, you know, very progress, a very progressive outlet like Alternet. You know, I was just throwing that up, and I went and searched on their website, and they've had story after story about problems with the no-fly list. And now here they are, it's like, what, do you want terrorists to buy guns? But some others are, are you know, and of course the New York Times has, has taken both positions. Right, the no-fly list uh, is unconstitutional, <laughs> but we should use it to keep people from being able to buy guns, which is also unconstitutional. It's, uh, and the New York Times is... Uh, if you're looking, if you're going to hold your breath waiting for consistency from the New York Times, I suggest you'd have the same amount of difficulty as waiting for the ACLU to start defending gun rights. So, yeah. yeah. So, well, you know, I, usually when I look for rationality, I do on these types of issues. I do turn to Reason.com, and I was actually really glad to see your piece over there. Um, I, I have a art, I have a column coming up about this tomorrow in the week. Um, and um, I was hoping it would be up today, but uh, because I actually was a little encouraged. It wasn't just Jamel Bowie, and I didn't see the Daily Beast one, but also the Los Angeles Times editorial board kind right. of reluctantly said, oh, you know, we, we think this is a bad idea. You know, <laughs> we, were, we were kind of sympathetic with the whole let's ban, you know, so-called assault weapons. Um, and, you know, the, but, but the no-fly list, is, that's kind of a bad idea, guys. And I was actually a little encouraged by that. I think people are starting to wake up, Scott. Yeah, that would be, you know, I'm, I'm seeing more people. And I think what it is is that we needed people to um, who weren't being defensive about gun ownership and really focusing it on the civil liberties issue of due process. Yeah. And that's what happened here. So it was, you know, people responded it in terms that 
Um, you don't have to be, you know, someone who loves guns or even supports gun rights. Um, you should support gun rights, but even if you don't support gun rights, um, you can read um, what people are saying about this and understand that it's much, much bigger issue than just guns. Right, right. This is a civil liberties due process issue. What we're basically saying here is that it's okay for the government to take away your civil rights based on the fact that some bureaucrats in some corner of the uh, federal government have decided that you particularly are a threat. And even though they're not going to tell you why, and even though they're never going to be able to um, defend, they're never going to be forced to defend it, uh, you're just going to have to suck it up, buddy, because uh, America or something. Um <laughs> So, yeah, you're right. It's an important issue. And like I said, I'm glad to see reason on it. So uh, that was, I, was that written yesterday? Was that post written yesterday, Scott? Yeah, that's, I wrote one. That one was written yesterday. I actually have one that I put up about an hour ago um, looking at, uh, because now there's the issue of, well, wait, which watch list are they talking about? Because there's lots of watch lists. Um, and they're saying no fly list, but what they, it looks like what they actually mean is the full terror watch list, which has like 700,000 people on it. Um, the no-fly list is only, I think, about uh, 50,000. Um, so what they're proposing is actually much broader than they're saying. And I actually looked at the legislation itself, um, and I was a little bit surprised to discover the one that that, uh, that failed. And it doesn't actually require that anyone be on the watch list or in the government database for the attorney general to decide that... Um, that they are a threat and, and can't purchase a gun. Now, you know, a caveat I put in this is because I don't, I'm not someone who writes laws for a living. Uh, and whenever <laughs> you read a federal regulation, it could be tough to parse. But, you know, I looked all the way through the thing and there was no reference to consulting any sort of database or lists, you know, whatever formal name they might use for them in order to make that determination. Yep. Yeah. That's a, it's a good point too, Scott. Well, look, I mean, the, the his original post on this, which was from yesterday, is uh, the link to that is in the show post. You can just go to reason.com and uh, find his uh, follow-up on this, and I think it's important that you do. Uh, but uh, continuing, continue to read reason.com. I love the guys at Reason. I, I don't necessarily agree with them all the time, but I certainly enjoy the writing, and I certainly enjoy the uh, robust defense of uh, civil liberties in a true sense over at reason.com and um, even when we don't necessarily agree on it it's always good to discuss and in this case i think we are four square in agreement on this scott yes definitely <laughs> all right scott thank you very much for being with us hopefully we can get you back on uh, again sometime to discuss the next um the next threat to american civil liberties well thanks for having me all right sir have a good afternoon you too <laughs> all right folks we're going to go ahead and move on i hope to get uh, our next guest on. So give me just a second to find him. Uh, I don't want to necessarily put the thing up here because I'm not sure I'm going to get him on the air because he has not re he has not responded yet. Um, oh, and this thing wants to install. There we go. Let's see. He has not yet responded to... Let's see. Well, we'll try to get him on the air anyway, but uh, he's not yet responded to the to my the contact. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please leave a message after. Well, okay. We're going to go ahead and talk for just a moment, and then we'll uh, we'll move along. I want to thank everybody for being in the chat room. I'm going to go ahead and give it a minute because I was just about a minute early on this. If it doesn't, uh, no installations. Yeah, you don't want to upgrade. You do not want to upgrade Skype in the middle of your show. It just... It's a bad idea. Super bad idea. So, yes, the um, uh, the the column I have coming out tomorrow actually kind of references... I think Cranky T-Rex will enjoy this because it actually has a movie reference. I, I bookend it with a movie reference. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let you try to guess what the movie reference is. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that anybody's done it yet. I think I'm the first one to pull this movie reference when it comes to talking about the no-fly list. So um, I think Cranky T-Rex Cranky T will approve. I really do. I think he'll approve. Um, don't call me. I'll hang up on you. <laughs> uh, Rick, too, wants to know, what, uh, what's the case for a badly run no-fly list? You know, and, and, and my cousin Mike, of course, who is a pilot, 
uh, says the, the TSA list is flawed. And, and, and clearly, there have been several issues with the no-fly list that has been implemented by TSA. I mean, I think anything you do is going to necessarily have flaws because it's run by people. And even if the list itself didn't have flaws, the use of it would eventually have you know, errors and, and that sort of thing introduced into it. The, the question is, is it so flawed that it loses its value in trying to keep uh, terror-related people off of airplanes? Um, I don't know that answer, quite frankly. I, I would actually ask that to Mike and um, and see what he thinks about that. And, you know, he can be as nonspecific about that as he'd like um, just to get his uh, reaction to it. But I understand why it's being done. But what it cannot be used for is to branch out from that i mean if you have somebody who you suspect is so dangerous that they can't exercise a constitutional right to defend themselves then you should be arresting that person and trying them in court or kicking them out of the country if they're not an american citizen and if you can't do that then they don't belong in a list that that you use for any other purpose except for the specifically intended purpose of that particular list which is not to, it was just to keep them from, from using airplanes, from boarding airlines. All right, let's go ahead and give Richard, uh, Colonel Kemp one more, t one more try. The person who... Okay, it does look like, uh, does look like he's not going to be on today. Uh, I might try to get him back on and uh, just to remind people, the reason why we had him coming on was to talk about the Prager University. Um, I'm just going to check my email real quick. The uh, Prager University... Um, um, video that went up uh, probably a couple hours ago now. Yeah, I guess it, I guess it went up three hours ago. Is Israel the most moral? Is 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 Israel's IDF? <laughs> this was my error on the headline. Is Israel's IDF the most moral army in in the world and in world history? And uh, Colonel Richard Kemp, who was a um, British commander of um, uh, forces in Afghanistan, British forces in Afghanistan, obviously, and was an observer to the war in Gaza, argues very strenuously that the IDF is the most moral army in the world. And and I say that's a bold statement, you know, kind of quoting Vincent Vega from Pulp Fiction in the Post, um, because I know Americans like to think that our military is actually the most moral army in uh, world history. And I think the argument can be made because we have liberated nations without demanding uh, pieces of their land. We, we stay only as long as we are welcome. The only land we claim, as Colin Powell once movingly said, was enough space to bury our dead. And, and actually, he may have been quoting somebody else from that, but I know Colin Powell made that statement, so I'll, I'll credit him at least here. Uh, that, to me, is um, is a pretty good claim for being the most moral army in, or military in world history. But, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that the IDF um, doesn't get credit for trying to, trying to operate within the parameters of war that Western nations have adopted, but most, if not all of its enemies refuse to fight by. And, uh, and I think the Gaza war was a really great example of that as, Colonel Kemp uh, stated, but unfortunately, it doesn't look like he is available. Um, and frankly, I'm not sure he understood that we were talking about this particular period in time because I believe that Colonel Kemp is still in the UK, and it would be rather late <laughs> out there, like about 11 o'clock at night, maybe a little later than that. I'm not sure how they do summertime there. Oh, I'm sorry, they're not in summertime, so 11 o'clock at night. So it's possible that we just had a misunderstanding about what time the uh, call was going to come in. Uh, at any rate. <clears throat> We'll go ahead and wrap things up here. I want to thank the folks in the chat room. Um, I want to thank Cranky T-Rex, Duke of the Dance, at Cranky T-Rex for, uh, for those who are on Twitter. You should be following him if you're not already following him. I'm not sure what you're waiting for because he's a lot of fun on Twitter. Great uh, Twitter um, voice for Gamergate and a great, um, a great defender of the Gamergate uh, group. And you can read more about what he writes about at buzzpo.com and occasionally at hotair.com. Uh, we got a chance to do some dueling, uh, some dueling movie reviews, and we found out that we both really like the movie, same movie, Creed, uh, which was really an excellent movie. Uh, I think both of us highly recommend it. Uh, 
But maybe we'll get a chance to do one on which we disagree and we'll have dueling movie reviews for that. That would be fun. Um, oh, uh, Prairie Dog SD asks, what's the inside scoop on Bullets and Bourbon? Hey, it was a lot of fun at Bullets and Bourbon. I want to thank the, um, by the way, I want to thank the sponsors, Kangaroo Carry, uh, the Texas Association, uh, the Texas, uh, golly, let me go ahead and pull that up. Uh, I did have that up as a, um, let me see if I can pull up the uh, list of sponsors. I don't have them memorized, unfortunately, but let's see. The um, Kangaroo Carry, uh, which is a, uh, they make uh, fine holsters. Uh, Texas, and by the way, I got a, I got a, like a certificate for one. I got to, I got to redeem that. Texas Concealed Handgun Association. That was the, uh, that was the other one. And Rolling Thunder Cigars. And I actually had a Rolling Thunder cigar and it was, pretty darn good i was standing around a campfire with vodka pundit um and a couple of other um a couple other attendees and we were basically riffing on like movie references and and television shows and having a great time i'd never actually spent much time with stephen green and he's just this really super nice guy great to talk to uh raconteur uh definitely well-versed in mixology. <laughs> I had an old-fashioned for the first time, and uh, that was actually pretty cool. I'm not much of a bourbon drinker. Uh, and then I was out there, and I was uh, shooting an AR-15, and uh, it was the first time I'd done that. I tweeted out a picture of myself from the first time I picked up the gun, and Adam Baldwin said, <laughs> tweeted me back and said, you need to lean forward a little. You need to lean into it a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't the only one who was telling me that. The guy in the picture behind me was telling me the same thing. So... I got better at it, but I'm still more of a pistol guy. I had a had a really good uh, had a really good time at Bullets and Bourbon. I want to thank Nina Yabluck and uh, Ed Driscoll for uh, inviting me to be part of that. And uh, they're going to do it again next year, so keep your eyes open. Glenn uh, Reynolds was there. His wife Helen, uh, Doctor Helen, as you'd know her. Um, golly, who else? Uh, Dana Lash was there. Uh, Roger Simon from PJ Media was there. It was really great. We had a really good time. Lots of interesting folks there. And, um, yeah, highly recommended. If you get a chance to do it next year, it'll be the same time, first week in, De in December at uh, Rough Creek Lodge, which was wonderful. Terrific folks there, too. So, yeah, it was uh, bullets and then much separated from that bourbon. Uh, I know that some people were a little put off by the, the name of the event, but, no, we weren't mixing those two things. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty good about making sure that people aren't doing that out there. They have people on site making sure that everybody's following the safety uh, regulations. And, um, yeah, their, their support teams were great at Rough Creek Lodge. Definitely would also encourage people to check that out, too, because Rough Creek Lodge was a lot of fun. Um, all right. We did duel on the uh, interview. That's right. And we both hated the interview. So, yeah, we've, we've done it twice. And both times we agreed. We have to find one. You know, we've got to do like Pacific Rim 2, except I won't go to the, I won't pay to go and see that. So we'll figure out something. We'll figure out something. All right. Everyone had a drink in one hand and a gun in the other. No, they most certainly did not. Uh, safety was the uh, safety was the key out there. All right. Who else has been in the, the chat room? Let's. Uh, oh, by the way, I should mention my cousin Mike, TR4A, who was uh, who was ho handling the troll gun. Speaking of guns, handling the troll gun. So. Thank you for keeping the chat room safe for democracy, Mike. And uh, don't forget to put your own URLs up in the show, up in the chat room. We're all about shameless blog promotion here at the Ed Morrissey Show. Including, of course, mentioning my book, Going Red, coming out April 2016. The link is in the show post. You can buy it. Uh, you can pre-order it, I should say. But the book is coming out in April 2016. If you want to know how Republicans and conservatives can win 2016, you'll want to read Going Red. All right. Who else has been in the chat room? Well, we've got Brett Nichols, my Hugh Crew Cruise cruise mate in the chat room. We've got Fausta from FaustaBlog.com, a great Western Hemisphere blog. I read her every single day. She's got some great stuff about the elections in Venezuela, too, by the way. Uh, well, Juanito Cabron, Mr. Fastbucks, Prairie Dog SD, Rick 2, Sontas, T Rand, Via Paso, at the Ancestral Morris Events! I'm on. And, of course, the first mate behind me, keeping me on the straight and narrow. Don't forget Thursday, we'll be having Dwayne Generalissimo Patterson come back to talk to us about what's going on in the world. Uh, plus, we may have. Uh, we may 
actually have a couple of guests coming in on Thursday, so stay tuned for that. Uh, for um, Scott Shackford, Andrew Malcolm, and myself, have yourselves a great afternoon, folks. Don't miss a minute of the Ed Morrissey Show. We'll see you later.